I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Twelve Monkeys. That was a movie made in the 90s by Terry Gilliam uh, of Monty Python fame. Uh, A person who was born and raised in the same city that I'm in. So he's always been sort of like a a thing that weirdly not too many people know about. Only people that go to art school uh, talked about him all the time, uh, as I personally experienced. Uh, Beautiful, young, perfectly soft lips and full-cheeked. Uh, Brad Pitt starred in that movie and um, I remember what stood out about that was that he refused to let people see his baby blue eyes he wore contacts to make his eyes brown because he felt that no one takes his uh, he wants to make sure that people take his acting seriously in this movie which I find disturbing only in the fact that he personally believed that his eye color affected how people saw him like boy is he cute but you put those crap brown eyes on him and now suddenly like ah the guy looks like human garbage uh so apparently he doesn't think people's faces matter when it comes to attractiveness but that was a movie about a horrible virus that swept the that plagued the earth and drove everyone that survived underground and uh they had to form their own system of government and since terry gilliam directed brazil uh that system of government is both weird and and creepy It made you uncomfortable to watch it, but that is the nature of art. Uh, We're two-thirds of the way there. We have a virus that's driving everyone indoors, uh, canceling public events here in uh, beautiful America. Uh, We have schools closing now, finally. My kids don't go to school starting tomorrow on Monday. And um, and yeah, uh, then I'm also supposed to work from home. So... I'm in my basement right now. So not only do we have a virus and I've been driven underground, uh, I might start my own system of government with my children here all the time. And it will be harsh and bizarre and hard to watch, just like the movie Brazil. Eh, We don't have the time travel yet. That was a big part of that movie. But we'll see what I come up with because as my... uh, you know, I have to do things like mop floors and I'll be doing a lot of cleaning since I'll be in the house and maybe I'll stumble across something, especially if I decide to go through some of the boxes in my basement. Um, who knows? Anything can happen. As we learn right now, anything can happen. Uh, one of my closest friends got paranoid and told me I have to start saving up food for two weeks because he thinks the world's ending and he told me that. Oh, I'm so glad to be done with this book. Uh, Except for the racism and how dismissive it was about suicide. uh, It was just kind of fine. It was there. It wasn't the the worst thing I've ever read. Not the best either. It's just very cute. Cute from the beginning, cute to the end. Except for the racism and the way it treats suicide. I'm kind of glad to be done with this book. So I'm going to read the last two chapters. Chapter 11 and chapter 12 all in one so I can move on with my life and read stuff that I'm excited to read. Uh, And I got other crap to do tonight. So, this might be a little bit longer episode, but we're wrapping this thing up. 11 and 12, we're done. So let's begin. Chapter 11. The Candidacy of Mr. Smith. Ah, boys, said Mr. Smith to the two hostlers stepping out onto the sidewalk in front of the hotel. Hoist that there British Jack over the place. Hoist her up there good. Then he stood and watched the flag fluttering in the wind. Billy, he said to the desk clerk, get a couple more and and put them up on the roof of the cab behind the hotel. Wire down to the city and get a quotation on a hundred of them. 
Take them signs, American drinks out of the bar. Yeah, put up new ones, N-O-O ones, with British beer at all hours. Clear out the rye whiskey and order in scotch and Irish. And then go up to the printing office and get me them placards. Then another thought struck Mr. Smith. Say, Billy, he said, wire to the city for 50 pictures of King George. Ah, uh, get them good and get them colored. I uh, don't matter what they cost. All right, sir, said Billy. And Billy, called Mr. Smith, as still another thought struck him. Indeed, the moment Mr. Smith uh, went into politics, yeah, you could see thoughts strike him like waves. Get 50 pictures of his father, old King Albert. All right, sir. And say, I tell you, while you're at it, uh, get some of the old Queen Victoria, if you can. Uh, get him in the morning uh, with a harp, one of the lions, and a three-pointed prong. It was on the morning after the conservative convention, Josh Smith had been chosen the candidate. And now the whole town was covered with flags and placards, and there were bands in the streets every evening. The noise and music and excitement that went on from morning till night. Election times are exciting enough, even in the city. But there, the excitement dies down in the business hours. In Mariposa, there aren't any business hours, and the excitement goes on all the time. Mr. Smith uh, had carried the convention before him. There had been a feeble attempt to put up Nivens, uh, but everyone knew that he was a lawyer uh, and a college man. He uh, wouldn't have a chance by a man with a broader outlook like Josh Smith. So the result was that Smith was the candidate, and there were placards out all over town with Smith and British Alliance in big letters. And people were wearing badges with Mr. Smith's face on one side and King George's on the other. Ah, and the fruit store next to the hotel had been cleaned out and turned into committee rooms with a gang of workers smoking cigars in it all day and a half the night. There are other placards, too, with Bagshaw and Liberty, Bagshaw and Prosperity, a vote for old Missinaba Standard Bear and... Uptown beside the Mariposa house, there was the Bagshaw committee rooms with a huge white streamer across the street and with a gang of Bagshaw workers uh, smoking their heads off. But Mr. Smith uh, had an estimate made which showed that nearly two cigars to one were smoked in his committee rooms as compared uh, with the liberals. Uh, it was the first time in five elections that the conservative had been able to make such a showing as that one yeah, might mention, too, that there were drone placards out. Five or six of them. Yeah, little things about half the size of a pocket handkerchief. Yeah, with a statement that Mr. Edward Drone solicits the votes of the electors of Missinaba County. But you would never notice them. And then Drone tried to put up a streamer across the main street with Drone and Honesty. Yeah, the wind carried it away into the lake. The fight... Eh, was really between Smith and Bagshaw, and everybody knew it from the start. I wish that I were able to narrate all the phrases and the turns of the great contest from the opening of the campaign till the final polling day, but it would take volumes. First of all, of course, the trade question was hardly discussed in the two newspapers of Mariposa and the news packet, and the Times-Herald literally bristled with statistics. Then came interviews with the candidates and the expression of their convictions in regard to uh, tariff questions. Uh, Mr. Smith, said the reporter of the Mariposa news packet, uh, we'd like to get your views on the effect of the postponed reduction of the differential duties. Oh, by gosh, Pete, said Mr. Smith. Uh, you can search me. Have a cigar. And what do you think, Mr. Smith, would be the result of lowering the ad valorem British preference and admitting American goods at a, a reciprocal rate? Uh, it's a corker, ain't it? Uh, answered Mr. Smith. Uh, what do you take, lager or domestic? And in that short dialogue, Mr. Smith showed that he had instantaneously grasped the whole method of dealing with the press. The interview yeah, in the paper the next day said that Mr. Smith, while unwilling to state positively that the principal tariff discrimination was at a variance with sound fiscal science, was firmly in opinion that any reciprocal interchange of tariff preferences with the United States must invariably lead to a serious per capita uh, reduction of the national industry. Mr. Smith, uh, said the chairman of the delegation of the manufacturers of Mariposa, uh, what, do you, what do you propose to do uh, in regard to the tariff if you're elected? Boys, answered Mr. Smith, 
I'll put her up so darned high they'll never know how to get her down again. Well, Mr. Smith, uh, said the chairman of another delegation, I'm an old free trader. Ah, put it there, said Mr. Smith. So am I. Uh, there ain't nothing like it. Uh, what do you think about imperial deference? Asked another questioner. Which, said Mr. Smith, imperial deference? Of what? Of everything. Yeah, who says it? Said Mr. Smith. Everyone's talking about it. What do conservative boys at the Ottawa think about it? Answered Mr. Smith. Uh, they're all for it. Well, then I'm for it, too, said Mr. Smith. And yeah, these little conversations represented the only, the first stage of the argumentative stage of the great contest. It was during this period, for example, that the Mariposa news packet absolutely proved that the price of hogs in Mariposa was decimal six higher than the price of oranges in Southern California, and, and that the average uh, decennial import of eggs in the Missinaba County had increased four decimal uh, six eight two in the last fifteen years more than the import of lemons in New Orleans. Figures of this kind made the people think, most certainly. After all, this came the organizing stage, and after that the big public meetings, ah, and rallies. Now perhaps you've never seen a county being organized. Oh, it's a wonderful sight. First of all, the Bagshaw men drove through the crosswise and top buggies and then drove through it again, ah, lengthwise. Whenever they met a farmer, they went in and ate a meal with him. And after the meal, they took him out of the buggy and gave him a drink. After that, the man's vote was absolutely solid until it was tampered with by feeding a conservative. In fact, ah, the only way to show a farmer that you are in earnest is to go in and eat a meal with him. If you won't eat it, he won't vote for you. That is the recognized political test. Which is pretty true. You see every politician do that in small towns now. Uh, but of course, uh, just as soon as the Bagshaw men had begun to get the farming vote solidified, the Smith buggies came driving through in the other direction, eating meals and distributing cigars and turning all the farmers back into conservatives. Here and there, you might see Edward Drone, uh, the independent candidate, wandering round from farm to farm in the dust of the political buggies. To each of the farmers, he explained that he pledged himself to give no bribes, to spend no money, and to offer no jobs. And each one of them gripped him warmly by the hand and showed him the way to the next farm. After the organization of the county, there came the period of the public meetings and the rallies uh, and the joint debates between the candidates and their supporters. I suppose there was no place in the whole dominion where the trade question, the reciprocity question, was threshed out ah, quite so thoroughly and in quite such a national patriotic spirit as in Mariposa. Uh, for a month at least, people talked to nothing else. A man would stop another in the street and tell them that he had read last night that the average price of an egg in New York was decimal, ought one more than the price of an egg in Mariposa. And the other man would stop the first one later in the day and tell him that the average price of a hog uh, in Idaho was 0.6 of a cent per pound less, or more, he couldn't remember for the, for the moment, but the, the average price of a beef in Mariposa. People lived on figures of this sort, and the man who could remember the most of them stood out as a born leader. But of course, it was the public meetings that were the things that were most fully discussed. It would take volumes to do full justice to all the meetings that they held in, Mispa, in Missinaba County, eh, where here and there, single speeches stood out as masterpieces of convincing oratory. Take, for example, uh, the speech of John Henry Bagshaw at the Tecumseh Corner Schoolhouse. The Mariposa Times-Herald said the next day that this speech will go down in history. And so it will, ever so far down. Anyone who's heard Bagshaw knows what an impressive speaker he is. And on this night when he spoke with the quiet dignity of an old man in years and anxious only to serve his country, he almost surpassed himself near the end of the speech. Somebody dropped a pin, and the noise of it made in falling, and fairly rattled the windows. I am an old man now, gentlemen, Bagshaw said, and the time must soon come when I must not only leave politics, but must take my way toward the goal from which no traveler returns. There was a deep hush then when Bagshaw said this. It was understood to imply 
that he thought of going to the United States. Yes, gentlemen, I am an old man, and I wish when my time comes to go, to depart, leaving as little animosity behind me as possible. But before I go, I want it uh, pretty clearly understood that there are more darn scoundrels in the conservative party than ought to be tolerated in any decent community I bear. He continued, Malice eh, toward none, and I wish to speak with gentleness to all. But what I will say is that how any set of rational, responsible men could nominate such a skunk as a conservative party candidate passes the bounds of my comprehension. Gentlemen, in the present campaign, there is no room for vindictive abuse. Let us rise to a higher level than that. They tell me that my opponent, uh, Smith, is a common saloon keeper. Uh, let it pass. They tell me that he has stood convicted of uh, horse stealing and that he's a notable perjurer. That he is uh, known as the blackest hearted liar in Missinaba County. Let us not speak of it. Ooh, uh, let no whisper of it pass our lips. No, gentlemen, continued Bagshaw, pausing to take a drink of water. Let us rather consider this question on the high plane of national welfare. Let us not think of our own particular interests, but let us consider the good of the country at large. And to do this, eh, let me present to you some facts in regard to the price of barley in Tecumseh Township. Then, amid a deep stillness, Bagshaw read off the list of prices of 16 kinds of grain in 16 different places during 16 years. Ah, well, let me return. The Bagshaw went on to another phrase of the national subject, and view for a moment the, the price of marsh hay in Missinaba County. When Bagshaw sat down that night, it felt that a liberal vote in Tecumseh Township was a foregone conclusion. But here, they hadn't reckoned on the political genius of Mr. Smith. When he heard the next day of the meeting, he summoned some of his leading speakers to him and said, Yeah, boys, they're beating us on uh, them uh, statistics. Aren't aren't good enough. Then he turned to Nivens, and he said, uh, What was them figures you had here the other night? Nivens took out a paper and began reading. Yeah, stop, said Mr. Smith. What was the figure for bacon? Fourteen million dollars, said Nivens. Yeah, not enough, said Mr. Smith. Yeah, make it twenty. Yeah, they'll stand for it, them farmers. Nivens changed it. And what was that uh, for hay? Two dollars a ton. Show it up to four, said Mr. Smith. And I'll tell you, he added, if any of them farmers say the figures ain't correct, tell them to go to Washington and see for themselves. Say that if any man yeah, wants proof of your figures, let him go to England and ask. Tell them to go straight to London and see it all for themselves in the books. After this, there was no more trouble over statistics. I must say, though, that it is a wonderfully convincing thing to hear trade figures of this kind properly handled. Perhaps the best man on this sort of thing in the campaign was Mullins, the banker. A man of his profession simply has to have figures of trade and population and money at his fingers' ends, and the effect of it in public speaking is wonderful. No doubt you've listened to speakers of this kind, but I question whether you've ever heard anything more typical of the sort of effect that I allude to than Mullins' speech at the big rally at the fourth concession. Mullins himself, of course, knows the figures so well that he never bothers to write them into notes, and the effect is very striking. Now, gentlemen, he said very earnestly, how many of you know just to what extent the exports of this country have increased in the last ten years? How many could tell what percent of increase there was been in one decade of our national importation? Yeah, then Mullins paused and looked around. Not a man knew it. I don't recall, he said, exactly the precise amount myself, not at this moment, but it must be simply tremendous. Or take the question of population, Mullins went on, warming up again, as a board statistician always does at the proximity of figures. How many of you know... How many of you can state uh, what has been the decennial percentage increase in our leading cities? There he paused. Hey, would you believe it? Not a man could state it. I don't recall the exact figures, said Mullins, but I have them at home and they are positively colossal. But just in one phase of the public speaking, the candidacy of Mr. Smith received a serious setback. It had been arranged that Mr. Smith should run on a platform of total prohibition, but they soon found that it was a mistake. They had imported a special speaker from the city, a grave man with a white tie, who put his whole heart into the work and would take nothing for it except his expenses and a sum of money for each speech. But beyond the money, I say, he would take nothing. He spoke one night at the Tecumseh Corner Social Hall at the same time when the liberal meeting was going on at the Tecumseh Corner Schoolhouse. Gentlemen, he said, 
as he paused halfway through his speech. While we are gathered here in earnest discussion, do you know what is happening over at the meeting place of our opponents? Do you know that 17 bottles of rye whiskey were sent out from this town the afternoon to that innocent and unsuspecting schoolhouse? 17 bottles of whiskey hidden in between the blackboard of the wall, and every single man that attends that meeting, mark my words, every single man, will drink his fill of the abominable stuff at the expense of uh, the liberal candidate. Just as soon as the speaker said this, you could see uh, the Smith men at the meeting look at one another in injured surprise, and before the speech was half over, the hall was practically empty. After that, uh, the total prohibition plank was charged... Uh, changed, and the committee substituted a declaration in favor of such form of restricted license as should promote temperance while encouraging the manufacture of spiritus liquors, and by a severe regulation of the liquor traffic should place intoxicants only in the hands of those fitted to use them. Finally, there came the great day itself, thank God. The election day, uh, that brought, as everyone knows, the crowning triumph of Mr. Smith's career. There's you no know, need to speak of it at any length, because it has become a matter of history. In any case, everybody who has ever seen Mariposa knows just what the election day is like. The shops, of course, are, as a matter of custom, uh, all closed. And the bar rooms are all closed by law, so that you have to go in by the back way. Ah, oh, and all the people in their best clothes, and at first they walk up and down the street, mm, in solemn way, just as they do on the 12th of July, uh, and on St. Patrick's Day. Before the fun begins, everyone keeps looking in at the different polling places to see if anyone else has voted yet, because, of course, nobody cares to vote first for fear of being fooled, after all, and voting on the wrong side. Most of all, do the supporters of Mr. Smith, acting under his instructions, hang back from the poll in the early hours to Mr. Smith's mind, voting was to be conducted on the same plan as bear shooting. Hold back your votes, eh, boys, he said. Oh, and don't be too eager. Wait till she begins to warm up, and then let them have it good and hard. In each of the polling places in Mariposa, there is a returning officer, and with him are two scrutineers. And the electors, I say, peep in and out like mice looking into a tramp. But if once the scrutineers get a man well into the polling booth, they push him in uh, behind a little curtain and make him vote. The voting, of course, is uh, by secret ballot so that no one except the scrutineers oh, and the returning officer and the two or three people who may be round the poll can possibly tell uh, how a man is voted. That's how it comes about that the first results are often so contradictory and conflicting. Sometimes the poll is badly arranged and the scrutineers are unable to see properly just how the ballots are being marked and they count up the liberals and conservatives in different ways. Often, too, a voter makes his mark so hurriedly, uh, carelessly, that they have to pick it out of the ballot box and look at it and see what it says. I suppose eh, that may have been why it was that in Mariposa the results came out at first in such a conflicting way. Perhaps that was how it was that the first reports showed that Edward Drone, the independent candidate, was certain to win. You should have seen how the excitement grew upon the streets when the news was circulated. In the big rallies and meetings of the liberals and conservatives, everybody had pretty well forgotten all about drone. And when the news got round at about four o'clock that the drone vote was carrying the poll, the people were simply astounded. Uh, not that they were pleased. Uh, on the contrary, they were delighted. Uh, everyone came up to drone and shook hands and congratulated him and told him that they had known all along uh, what the country wanted was a straight honest, non-partisan. Uh, the conservatives said openly that they were sick of party, utterly done with it, and the liberals said that they hated it. Already three or four of them had taken Drone aside and explained uh, that it was needed in the town it was a straight, clean, non-partisan post office, built on a piece of ground and with strictly non-partisan character and constructed under contracts that were not tainted and smirched with party affiliation. Two or three men uh, were willing to show to Drone just where a piece of ground of this character could be bought. They told him, too, that in the matter of the post uh, postmastership itself, that they had nothing against Trelawney, yeah, the present postmaster, in any personal sense, and would say nothing against him except merely that he was utterly and hopelessly unfit for his job, and that if Drone believed that he had said he did, in a purified civil service, he ought to begin by purifying Trelawney. Already, 
Edward Drone was beginning to feel something of what it meant to hold office, and there was creeping into his manner the quiet of self-importance, which is the first sign of conscious power. In fact, in that brief half-hour of office, Drone had a chance to see something of what it meant. Henry McGinnis came to him and asked straight out for a job as federal census taker on the ground that he was hard up and had been crippled with rheumatism all winter. Nelson Williamson asked for the post of Wharf Master on the plea that he had been laid up with sciatica all winter and was absolutely fit for nothing. Er Erasmus Archer asked him if he could get his boy Pete into one of the departments at Ottawa and made a strong case of it by explaining that he had tried his crudest to uh, get Pete a job anywhere else, and it was simply impossible. Not that Pete wasn't a willing boy, but he was eh, slow. Even his father admitted it. As slow as the devil, blast him. Eh, with no head for figures, and unfortunately he never had the schooling eh, to bring him on, but if Drone would get him in at Ottawa, his father truly believed it would be the very place for him. Surely in the Indian Department or the Astronomical Branch or in the new Canadian Navy, there must be any amount of opening for a boy like this. And all the requests, Drone found himself explaining that he would take the matter under his very earnest consideration. That they must remember that he had to consult his colleagues and not merely follow the dictates of his own wishes. In fact, if he had ever in his life any envy of cabinet ministers, he lost it in this hour. The drone's hour was short. Even before the poll had closed in Mariposa, the news came sweeping in. True or false, that Bagshaw was carrying the county. Ah, the second concussion had gone for Bagshaw as a regular landslide. Six votes to only two for Smith. And all down the township line road where the hay farms are, Bagshaw was said to be carrying all before him. Just as soon as that news went around the town, they launched the Mariposa Band of the Knights of Pythias, every man in it is a liberal, down to the main street uh, with big red banners in front of it, with the motto, Bagshaw Forever, in letters, a uh, foot high, each rejoicing, and enthusiasm began to set in as you'd never saw. Everybody crowded around Bagshaw on the steps of the Mariposa house and uh, shook his hand and said that they're proud to see a day uh, that the Liberal Party was the glory of the Dominion, and that as for this idea of nonpartisan politics, the very thought of it made them sick. Yeah, right away in the committee rooms, they began to organize a demonstration for the evening with lantern slides ah, and speeches, ah, and they arranged for a huge bouquet uh, to be presented to Bagshaw on the platform by four little girls, all liberals, all dressed in white. And it was just at this juncture, with one hour of voting left, that Mr. Smith emerged from his committee rooms and turned his voters on the town, much as the Duke of Wellington sent the whole line to the charge at Waterloo. From every committee room and subcommittee room, they poured out in flocks with blue badges fluttering on their coats. Get at it, boys, said Mr. Smith. Vote and keep on voting till they make you quit. Then... He turned to his campaign assistant. Billy, he said, wire down to the city that I am elected by an overwhelming majority and tell him to wire it right back. Send word by telephone to all the polling places in the county uh, that the whole town is gone to solid conservative and tell them to send the same news back here. Get carpenters. I'd tell them to run up the platform in front of the hotel. Tell them uh, to take the bar door, clean off its hinges, and be all ready the minute the poll quits. It was that last hour that did it, just as soon as the big posters went up in Windows of Mariposa news pack with the telegraphic dispatch that Josh Smith uh, was reported in the city uh, to be elected, and was followed by the messages from all over the country. County. The voters hesitated no longer. They had waited, most of them, all through the day, not wanting to make any error in their vote. But when they saw the Smith men crowding into the polls and heard the news from the outside, they went solid in one great stampede. And by the time the poll was declared closed at five o'clock, there was no shadow of doubt that the country was saved and that Josh Smith was elected for Miss Inaba. I wish you could have witnessed the scene in Mariposa that evening. Oh, it would have done your heart good. Such joy, such public rejoicing as you never saw. It turned out that there wasn't really a liberal in the whole town. And that they, there had never been any. 
They were all conservatives and had been for years and years. Men who had voted with pain and sorrow in their hearts for the Liberal Party for 20 years came out that evening and owned up straight that they were conservatives. They said they could stand the strain no longer and simply had to confess. Whatever the sacrifice might mean, they were prepared to make it. Even Mr. Galagatha Gingham, the undertaker, came out and admitted that he in working for John Henry Bagshaw, had been going straight against his conscience. He said that right from the start he had his misgivings. He said it had haunted him. Often at night when he would be working away quietly, one of those sudden misgivings would overcome him so that he could hardly go on with his embalming. Why, it appeared that on the very first day when reciprocity was proposed that he had come home and said to Mrs. Gingham that he thought it simply meant selling out the country. And the strange thing eh, was that ever so many others had just the same misgivings. Trelawney admitted that he had said to Mrs. Trelawney that it was madness. And Jeff Thorpe, eh, the barber, had, he admitted, gone home to his dinner the first day Reciprocity was talked of, and said to Mrs. Thorpe eh, that he would simply kill business in the country, count, yeah, country, <laughs> and introduce a cheap, shoddy American form of haircut that would render true loyalty impossible. And to think that Mrs. Gingham and Mrs. Trelawney and Mrs. Thorpe had all known this for six months and kept quiet about it. Yet I think there is good many Mrs. Gingham's in the country. It is merely another proof that no woman is fit for politics. Ugh. And the demonstration that night in Mariposa will never be forgotten. The, the excitement in the streets, the torchlights, the music, and the band of the Knights Pathias, and an organization which is conservative and all that name. And above all, the speeches and the patriotism. They had put up a big platform in front of the hotel. And on it were Mr. Smith and his chief workers, and behind them was a perfect forest of flags. They presented a huge bouquet of flowers to Mr. Smith, handed to him by four little girls in white, the same four that I spoke of above. Ugh. And for it turned out that they were all conservatives. Yeah, we get it. Then there were speeches. Judge Pepperly spoke and said that there was no need to dwell on the victory that they had achieved because it was history. There was no occasion to speak of what party himself had played within the limits of his official position, because what he had done was henceforth a matter of history, and Niven's lawyer has said that he would only say just a few words, because anything that he might have done now was history. Later generations, he said, might read it, but it was not for him to speak of it, because it belonged now uh, to the history of the country, and after them, others spoke in the same strain, and all refused absolutely to dwell on the subject for more than half an hour, on the ground that anything that they might have done was better left for future generations to investigate, and no doubt this was very true. As to some things, anyways, Mr. Smith, of course, said nothing. He didn't have to. Not for four years. And he knew it. God help me, this feels like it's going on forever, but it's only been 33 minutes. Chapter 12. L'Envoy. The Train to Mariposa, the final chapter. It leaves the city every day at about five o'clock in the evening, the train for Mariposa. Strange that you did not know of it, though you come from the little town, or did, long years ago. Odd that you never knew in all these years that the train was there every afternoon, puffing up steam in the city station, and that you might have boarded it any day and gone home. No, not, quote, home, unquote. Of course, you couldn't call it home. Now, home means that the big red sandstone house of yours in the costlier part of the city, home means, in a way, this mausoleum club. Where you sometimes talk with me of the times that you had as a boy in Mariposa. But, of course, home, this is all in quotes, would hardly be the word yeah, you would apply to the little town unless perhaps late at night when you've been sitting, reading in a quiet corner somewhere such a book as the present one. Naturally, you don't know a Mariposa train now. Years ago, when you first came to the city as a boy, with your way to make, you knew of it well enough, only too well. The price of a ticket count in those days, and though you knew of the train, you couldn't take it. But sometimes, from sheer homesickness, you used to wander down to the station on a Friday afternoon after your work. And watch the Mariposa people getting on the train and wish that you could go. Why, you knew that train at one time better, I suppose, than any other single thing in the city. And 
Loved it too, ah, for the little town and the sunshine that it ran to. Do you remember how when you first began to make money, you used to plan that just as soon as you were rich, really rich, you go back home again to the little town and build a great big house with a fine veranda. It had no stint about it, the best that money could buy. Plain lumber, every square foot of it, and a fine picket fence in front of it. Is to be one of the grandest and finest houses that thought could conceive much finer, in true reality, than that vast palace of sandstone with the port, courture, and the sweeping conservatives that you afterwards built in the costly part of the city. But if you have half forgotten Mariposa, the long since lost the way to it, you're only like the greater part of the men here in this mausoleum club in any city. Would you believe... <laughs> that practically every one of them came from Mariposa once upon a time, and that there isn't one of them that doesn't sometimes dream in the dull quiet of the long evening here in the club that some day he would go back and see the place. Ah, oh, they all do, only they're half ashamed to own it. Ask your neighbor there at the next table whether the partridge that they sometimes serves to you here can be compared to the moment that the birds that he and you and someone else used to shoot at boys in the spruce thickets along the lake. That was a weird sentence. Ask him if he ever tasted duck. That could for a moment be compared to the black ducks in the rice marsh along the Ossawippi. And as for fish, uh, and fishing. No, don't ask him about that. For if he ever, ever starts telling you of the chub they used to catch below the mill dam and the green bass they used to lie in the water shadow of the rocks beside the Indian's island, not even the long, dull evening in the club would be long enough for the telling of it. But no wonder, yeah, they don't know about the five o'clock train from Mas Mariposa, for very few people know about it, hundreds of them know that there is a train that goes out at five o'clock, ah, but they mistake it. Ever so many of them think it's just a suburban train, lots of people that take it every day think it's only the train that goes to the golf routes, but the joke is, after it passes out of the city, and the suburbs, and the golf grounds, it turns itself little by little into Mariposa train thundering and pounding toward the north with the hemlock sparks pouring out into the darkness from the funnel of it. Of course, you can't tell uh, just at first. Uh, all the people that were crowding into it with golf clubs and wearing knickerbockers and flat caps would deceive anybody. But the crowd of suburban people going home on commutation tickets and sometimes standing there thick in the aisles. Uh, those are, of course, not Mariposa people, but look around a little bit uh, and you'll find them easily enough here and there in the crowd. Those people with the clothes that are perfectly all right and yet look odd in some way. The women with the particular hats. Uh, what do you say? Last year's fashions? Ah, yes, of course. It must be it. Anyway, those are the Mariposa people, all right enough. Uh, that man with the two-collar Panama and glaring spectacles is one of the greatest judges that ever adored the bench at Missinaba County. That clerical gentleman with the wide black hat who is explaining to the band with him the marvelous mechanism of the new air brake, uh, one of the most conspicuous illustrations of the divine structure of the physical universe. Surely you have seen it before, Mariposa people. Ah, oh, yes. There are any number of them on the train every day. But of course, uh, you hardly recognize that while the train is still passing through the suburbs and the golf district and the outlying parts of the city area, but wait a little and you will see when the city is well behind you. Bit by bit, the train changes its character. The electric locomotive that you took through the city tunnels and now the, the old wood engine is hitched in its place. I suppose very probably you haven't seen one of those wood engines since you were a boy 40 years ago. Ah, the old engine with a wide top like a hat on its funnel. And the sparks, enough to light up a suit for damages once in every mile. Do you see, uh, too, the, the trim little cars that came out of the city on the electric suburban express are being discarded now at the way stations one by one. And in their place, the old familiar car with the stuffed cushions and red plush. How gorgeous it once seemed. And with a box stove set up at one end of it. The stove is burning. Furiously at its sticks this autumn evening, for the air sets in chill as you get clear away from the city and are rising up to the higher ground of the country of the pines and the lakes. Look! From the window, as you go, yeah, the city is far behind now, and right and left you are 
There are trim farms with elms and maples near them and with tall windmills beside the barns that you still see in the gathering dust. There's a dull red light from the windows of the farmstead. Yeah, it must be comfortable there after the roar and clatter of the city. And I only think of the still quiet of it. As you sit back, half dreaming in the car, you keep wondering why it is that you never came up before in all these years. Ever so many times you planned just that uh, as soon as the rush and the strain of business eased up a little, you would take the train and go back uh, to the little town to see what it's like now. And if things have changed much since your day, but each time when your holidays came, somehow you changed your mind and went down to Narragansett or Nagahucket or Naga something and left over the visit to Mariposa for another time. It is almost night now. You can still see the trees and the fences and the farmsteads, but they're fading fast in the twilight where they, they have lengthened out the train by this time with a string of flat cars and freight cars between where they are sitting in the engine. But at every crossway we can hear the long muffled roar of the whistle dying to a melancholy wail that echoes into the woods. The woods, I say, for the farms are thinning out and the track plunges here and there into the great stretches of the bush. Tall tamarack and red scrub willow the, with a tangled undergrowth of bush that has defied for two generations all attempts to clear it from the form of the fields. Why, look, ah, the great space that seems to open out in the half-dark of the falling evening. Why, surely, yes, Lake Ossawippi. Ah, the big lake, as they used to call it, from which the river runs down to the smaller lake. Lake Wissanati where the town of Mariposa has lain waiting for you there thirty years. This is the Lake Ossawippi, surely enough. You would know it anywhere by the broad, still, black water, with hardly a ripple, and with the grip of the coming frost already upon it. Such a great sheet of blackness. It looks as if the train thunders along the side, swinging the curve of the embankment at a breakneck speed as it rounds the corner of the lake. <sighs> is just going on forever. It's the last chapter and it won't end. How fast the train goes this autumn night, exclamation point. You have traveled, I know you have, in the Empire State Express, and the New Limited, and the Maritime Express that holds the record of 600 whirling miles from Paris to Marseilles. But uh, what are they to this? This mad career. This breakneck speed, this thundering roar of the Mariposa local, driving hard to its home, exclamation point. Don't Tell me that the speed is only 25 miles an hour. I don't care what it is. I tell you, and you can prove it to yourself if you will, that the train of mingled flat cars and coaches that goes tearing into the night, its engine whistle shrieking out as warning into the silent woods and echoing over the dull, still lake, is the fastest train in the whole world. Yes, and best too, the most comfortable, ooh, the most reliable, and the most luxurious, and the speediest train that's ever turned a wheel, and the most genial, and the most sociable too. See how the passengers all turn and talk to one another now, as they get near and near to the little town? That dull reserve that seemed to hold the passengers in the electric suburban has been vanished and gone. They are talking, listen, of the harvest, and the late election. And uh, how the local member is mentioned for the cabinet and all old familiar topics of the sort. Already the conductor has changed his glazed hat for an ordinary round Christie, and you can hear the passengers calling him and the brakesman Bill and Sam as if they're all one family. What is it now? Uh, 9.30? Ah, when we must be nearing the town, that big bush that we are passing, though. You remember it surely is the great swamp, just the side of the bridge over Ossawippi. There is the bridge itself, ah, and the long roar of the train as it rushes, sounding over the trestle work that rises above the marsh. Hear the clatter ah, as we pass the semaphores and switch lights. Ah, we must be close now. What? Yeah, it feels nervous and strange to be coming here again after all these years. Yeah, it must indeed. No, don't bother to look at the reflection of your face in the window pane shadow by the night outside. Nobody could tell you now, after all these years, your face has changed in the long years of money-getting in the city. Perhaps if you uh, come back now and again, just at odd times, it wouldn't have been so. There, you hear it? 
the long whistle of the locomotive. One, two, three! Exclamation point. You feel a sharp slackening of the train as it swings around the curve, the last embankment that brings it to the Mariposa station. See, too, as we round the curve, the row of flashing lights and the bright windows of the depot. How vivid and plain it all is. Just as it used to be 30 years ago, there is the string of the hotel buses drawn up ready for the train. And as the train rounds and the stops hissing and panting at the platform, you can hear above all other sounds the cry of the brakesmen and the porters. Mariposa, Mariposa. And as we listen, the cry grows fainter and fainter in our ears, and we are sitting here again in the leather chairs of the Mausoleum Club, talking of the little town and the sunshine that we once knew. Well, there was that. Uh, my final thoughts on the book? Yeah, it was average. It took the, uh, cute simplicity of simple people living in a small, simple town and really stretched that out to the max. Uh, did you get to learn anything, really, about the people? Uh, the closest thing you got to learn about any kind of internal conflicts or anything that make you want to identify with someone you're reading about is the guy that wanted to commit suicide, hilariously. Uh, he's the only one that you got to learn a little bit of his feelings and what's really going on in his head. Kinda. Still kept it pretty surface level. Everybody else were just cartoon characters uh, that just did cartoonish things and uh, were adorable. How do I tie this into 12 Monkeys in full circle? I can't. Maybe that's the problem with this book. I can't nail this book down into real life. It's just weird. Uh, it's cute. Uh, it's kind of something your grandpa would read and say, oh, it was so hilarious and so insightful, you should read it. But you won't. He'll give you the book. He'll even buy you a copy at Christmas and sign the cover on the inside, but you're never going to read it. You might read the first chapter and be like, eh, I already see where this is going. And you'd be right. So that was this book. Uh, he's a funny author. I've read some of his other stuff. But this one, mm, he should never do long form. Well, he should never have had done long form. He's dead now. He's been dead for a long time. I'm basically picking on a dead man. All right, well, that was it for this episode. Thank God I get to go back to short stories. Uh, and uh, I'll just start cranking those babies out since I'm going to be home all the time. Thanks for listening.